Hey everyone, it's Darwin here from GitLab. I just wanted to go through some information with you about handling dependencies of code in your GitLab CI pipelines. Dependency management of actual CI code itself can be a challenge. And you can see all through our auto DevOps that what we do in general is we have some GitLab CI YAML, which is managed to be nice and readable, uh, very minimal. And then we put the dependencies in a container. Now this is super important if you have a lot of runtime dependencies, like part of your pipeline is dependent on Node, but another part is dependent on Python. And you don't wanna work out uh, a container that perfectly holds all of those different runtimes. So it can be really advantageous. There's one circumstance though in which it can be unadvantageous. And I want to show you kind of a way to unwrap that pattern to work for that situation as well. So we're gonna talk about the most efficiency dependency management of all. So with GitLab CI, we'll have a pipeline. And typically what we'll do for the first level of kind of efficiency in managing dependencies is to break out uh, extensions. There's a variety of ways we do this in Auto DevOps. For instance, our SAS stage is a separate includable piece of the pipeline. You can do this yourself with uh, includes as well, like you see here on the screen. And there's a whole bunch of examples out in guided explorations uh, in a subgroup that uh, talks about how to build these kind of extensions. Now these extensions, of course, depend on another bit of GitLab CI YAML that's sitting out there. That bit of GitLab CI YAML has to be written in a way where it does not have any hard coding when it comes to including it in another project. So if there is input data that has to go into the, the code, then it has to be done in variables. And if there's anything you need back out, then you have to collect it as artifacts. So you wanna make it so that this bit of code, it's not really a template that you grab and customize, it's actually something you directly depend on and use. As I mentioned with GitLab Auto DevOps, you then can frequently end up depending on a container. And one of the situations in which you might do this in your own circumstance is you have some complicated shell script dependencies. For example, I have one situation where I need to do a lot of CloudFormation stuff. And I found some really nice libraries that are written in shell code, but there's a lot of code. And so to stick that right inside of my regular code makes it kind of messy, a whole bunch of functions that I might want to use across multiple jobs. And so the temptation is to very quickly, well, let me put all those in one file, put them in an image, and then they'll be self-contained and I'll be able to depend on them. But the, the challenge here is that the, the container itself isn't the only dependency once you encapsulate something in it. That container itself depends on a container registry. And that container registry has to have the container built and sent to it by some other kind of CI, which of course requires some sort of Docker file. So we end up with a chain of dependencies when using containers. Very advantageous when we've got to tightly run those runtimes, but potentially a challenge if all you're looking to do is especially manage some shell code uh, libraries. So some of the challenges that we kind of inherit are that the bandwidth and time of that container being pulled and then loaded. Uh, and that happens every time you use, actually it happens every job if you're on gitlab.com. We have the availability of the registry from a DevOps perspective as well as authentication to it if it's not a public registry. And then we have the container source files and also the build management. So how, how often do you build that container? Is it once in a while when you update it? Does it build monthly? Um, and then we also have the container contents versioning. So if you're working with your pipeline and you're like, oh my goodness, I need to update one of these uh, routines I depend on, you can no longer just update the GitLab CI YAML. You have to go back and update the container, re-rev the container, and then you're able to use it forward. So that versioning process or that dependency versioning uh, can be expensive both in development as well as at uh, runtime. So what if we could just completely eliminate this whole uh, realm here? So one of the architectural heuristics that I want to expose you to, which an, a heuristic is sort of like a rule. And a lot of times it's a rule that helps you pick something on a sliding spectrum. So it's not a, this is always good or this is always bad rule. It is usually dependent on other rules that you also process. So in this case, the architectural heuristic is eliminating dependencies when possible is the most efficient dependency management strategy. So if you just don't have a dependency, you don't ever have to manage it. Now that also kind of fundamentally implies all things being equal for code management. If I have some shell code libraries that comprise, you know, 256K of code, or maybe 
a lot more code or any binary dependencies, then all of a sudden, well, the container is probably the best solution. Looking at eliminating dependencies whenever possible is a high level order thing. And going into taking a dependency on something is something you want to do with caution whenever possible. So let's take a look at the actual code that I want to show you in regard to this. So I have this shell code libraries in pure GitLab CI YAML. And this code has several techniques to allow you to transit potentially large amounts of shellcode libraries along with your GitLab CI YAML. Let's look in the main uh, GitLab CI YAML. And we're going to just scoot right down to the bottom right away and see that we have included the um, shellcode library. So this is called shellcode libraries GitLab CI YAML. Now, when we look in this file, you're going to see there's not much in there. And we could have actually just included it directly here. So there's always that trade-off as well. Do you want another include dependency or do you want to put the code right here? In this case, originally I had the code right in this file because as long as it's at the bottom, it's not really in my way when I'm doing day-to-day -day maintenance of the code. But I wanted to show you sort of the Cadillac with it separated so that you can always merge these two files together if it makes sense for your uh, situation. Um, but you can see how it works when they're separated. So let's go into the shell code libraries. And this is where we have some shell code that is uh, going to be used throughout our pipeline. So that's the other aspect is we want to use it throughout our pipelines inside of the scripts that our pipelines are running. So you can't do it as a, an extends uh, as easily. And um, you also uh, can't do it as a YAML anchor as easily. You could potentially do some really complicated YAML anchors, but I appreciate uh, this approach a little bit better because I think it's a little bit cleaner. So the first thing that we do is we're going to write our libraries to disk uh, on in one of these stages. Now, one of the important things here is the stage is pre. So anything that's writing a library runs in the pre stage, which means before everything else. And then we collect that as an artifact and pass it to every subsequent container. So this is one of the little tricks that pre stage now will uh, allow us, even though this is low in our CI YAML file, it'll let us run this code and write it early. We're just going to use uh, standard uh, here doc or here string capabilities. So in this case, it's bash. So it's simply catting whatever is between this line here and the end of code line into this file. And we're doing it twice just to show that, you know, it doesn't matter how many times you want to do this. We're also using a file naming convention that anything with star code library dot sh is a bash library. I'm collecting them all. I didn't bother with worrying about the sh, and you'll see why here right now. So I like to write everything I write to enable both uh, the Windows DevOps side of the house as well as the Linux DevOps side of the house. So here we have Windows PowerShell and how this would work under Windows PowerShell. Now, when you're using Windows PowerShell, PowerShell is the default shell for GitLab CI, which means as soon as we hop in, we're writing PowerShell right away. And you can see here that there is also a concept of a here doc in PowerShell, and this is how it works. It's writing out a function, writing out another function, and then collecting any code library artifacts that we created. Of course, these could be rather large if necessary. And then finally, Linux PowerShell. So this happens a little bit different because most Linux hosts that run PowerShell, even the ones built by Microsoft, don't run it by default. They run Bash by default, and you call PowerShell. So it's just slightly different uh, in that we go ahead and cat uh, the same way as we do as Linux to build the libraries. We'll also see there's a little bit of difference when we write the libraries. Notice that we're following a convention with the file names that this is Linux code library PS1, which lets us know it's Linux for PowerShell. Up here we have uh, code library PS1, which lets us know that this is uh, Windows PowerShell. You could get more explicit and use Windows PowerShell. And then anything that's just code library shell is Linux bash. So that writes our files out. And once they're written out, we can then start using them in our main code. So let's go take a look at that. Inside of our main code here, we are doing bash PowerShell, Windows PowerShell, and uh, Linux PowerShell testing. So in many cases, you would have just one of these languages. And of course, you just grab the, the jobs out of here that are just for that one language if you have that situation. Uh, we're doing two jobs that use two different functions. It doesn't really matter where those functions came from. The, the, the little trick right here 
is to use this little loop to load the files with dot sourcing. So dot sourcing means load these into the current shell context. Um, you want to be careful about trying to move this code to another context like a before script because if it does not run in the exact same shell context, then of course when that shell unloads, uh, you won't have that code anymore. So you have to run this at the top of each of the jobs that's going to use any of the functions in the function library. So you see now we're very simple. We can just call these functions directly. I'm also admitting and documenting that, hey, you know, we got code libraries here just so that it's uh, easy for the next person through to see what's going on. Same thing happened here. Uh, we are loading the exact same files. And even though these two functions are in separate files, we load them all and then we run the functions. Uh, we're not going to accidentally load PowerShell functions here because of the file naming convention we talked about. Windows PowerShell, same thing, except the dot sourcing is a little bit different. Um, for those of you who don't know, PowerShell purposely took the best of Bash, the best of um, VMS, and all other kinds of shells and uh, tried to implement it. So consequently, there's some concepts that are very similar to Bash in PowerShell. And then here's another Windows PowerShell test and a Linux PowerShell test. One of the differences with Linux PowerShell, since PowerShell is not the default, um, is that we are actually doing a uh, here string uh, or a here doc to pipe the code that's in here, the PowerShell code that triggers our other PowerShell code uh, directly into PowerShell core. And so that's just uh, slightly different. And then down here is where we included all of that. It's probably hard to tell from these includes and the different stages how this process is. So we'll go look at pipelines that have completed. And we'll go to this one that's all shiny and lit up as successful. So we see here that the pre-stage runs first. Now, one thing you may not be aware of is that there are built-in stages for GitLab CI. So you notice I didn't have stages in my CI YAML, and that's because pre, build, test, and a few others are built into GitLab that if you don't have to declare them as stages, it knows how to use those ones. If I did declare stages, then I have to declare all of my stages uh, and completely override that default behavior. But by using pre, all of my write libs happen first. And then anything used in build gets used in build. Anything used in test gets used in test. You can see how that kind of uh, flows and works. So I hope that this has been helpful, helps you kind of understand how you might uh, write shellcode libraries completely in Bash uh, or PowerShell without having to resort to a container. Um, obviously, if you have a lot of dependencies or depend on different language types, then containers work uh, just awesome. I just wanted to show you a way to encapsulate uh, shell libraries specifically.